You want a pill that will make you feel that there's nothing wrong with you. Is that a good thing? If I step on a rusty nail, it goes through my shoe, through my sock, punctures my skin, I'm bleeding, and the doctor gives me a pill that I can now say I don't feel like there's anything wrong with me. This is very, very close to going to the heroin dealer and saying, can you give me something that will make me feel like there's nothing wrong in my life and by extension my world and he says sure and I say I guess I could get dependent on something like this and he says duh now right next to him is the psychiatrist who doesn't say duh she says let me help you and you take the pill and you feel the psychiatrist's help if you don't go into suicidal ideation and other immediate adverse reactions it actually dulls your pain oh god don't put that halo on me sarah put your hand on your head help me and you and the psychiatrist are are in a love boat there was a, a drug called Paxil. They made zillions of dollars with Paxil. And then it came out, Paxil was less efficacious than the sugar pill, than the placebo. They knew that, and they marketed it for one reason, to get you addicted. The CEO of one of these giant big pharma companies once said, there's two things you don't want to do. You don't want to kill the patient, and you don't want to cure the patient. This is not antibiotics we're talking about. This is the heroin dealer in a $2,000 suit with prostitute psychiatrists believing that if you have a certain symptom, give them this pill. Take, for example, Martin Keller, former chair of the psychiatry department at Brown University, lead author of the so-called Paxil 329 study. This clinical trial, which tested hundreds of children on the antidepressant Paxil, and hundreds of children, and hundreds, hundreds of, of children, children, found that the drug was generally well tolerated and effective, which in scientific terms is glowing praise. And the study's list of co authors 22 of the most prominent key opinion leaders in psychiatry. I mean, that was a lot of people, but they were the who's who of psychiatry. And this was going to be a publication that I think, you know, took them you know, the, into the end zone on getting their approval for kids. With the FDA's blessing, Paxil became a blockbuster in the child and adolescent market, with sales of $55 million in 2002. It wasn't until the New York State Attorney General's office sued in 2004 that the truth finally came out. The raw data showed that not only was Paxil no more effective than placebo, but the young patients on Paxil were six times more likely to have suicidal thoughts. In fact, this data also revealed that 11 of the 93 children on the study developed serious side effects, of whom seven had to be hospitalized, of whom seven had to be hospitalized, of, of whom seven, seven had, had to be hospitalized. hospitalized. But according to Keller's own administrator, many of those children were either dropped from the study or coded as non-compliant to avoid having to be counted. While admitting no guilt, the drug company settled out of court for $2.5 million, less money than Paxil was grossing every seven hours. Hundreds of civil suits followed, but when Dr. Keller, as lead author of the Paxil 329 study, was deposed by attorneys, he would not admit to much. I can't remember exactly what I said. I, I don't remember anything specific about any of these meetings. If my name wasn't on the top, I wouldn't remember ever having seen it. If I saw them, I don't remember. The answer is, I don't remember. I don't recall if I was. I don't recall asking him, which isn't to say that I didn't. 
I want to pick up on the uh, question Mr. Coffin asked you about the five-fold increase of the Paxil kids uh, experiencing suicidality over the placebo kids. Do you recall those questions? I do. And you said that you weren't, you weren't particularly aware of that except for with regard to a manuscript that was sent to you in confidence by GSK? Correct. That, that actually is not correct, though. I mean, you actually, this was an issue that had been presented to you by a number of different reporters that you personally responded to. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I don't remember. How could Dr. Keller have known so little about the drug study of which he was lead author and which he himself used to promote Paxil for children in prominent medical journals and conferences? The ultimate publication of, of Study 329 was ghostwritten by an agency hired by GlaxoSmithKline, and um, eventually, they, uh, after the manuscript was written, uh, they put Martin Keller's name on it as an author. You know, there again, and maybe you can tell me where I can find it in the paper. No, I'm asking you if you were aware. I, I don't remember the specifics. And then we finally showed him a document from GlaxoSmithKline where GlaxoSmithKline says that the study was entirely flawed. It was a complete failed study, and it certainly didn't show that Paxil was remarkably efficacious for treating children and adolescents in depression. Can you read that into the record, please? Essentially, the study did not really show Paxil was effective in treating adolescent depression, comma, which is not something we want to publicize. We asked him, with that information now, you know, how can you s tell us that it would be okay and safe to give a kid Paxil? And he couldn't answer the question. He, he sat back, he put his he head in his hands, and for, you know, the longest two minutes sat there silent. During the last two years of his Paxil study, Keller personally pocketed a million dollars in drug company money, none of which he disclosed in his published research.